Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Today we're going to be talking about Noah, Daniel, Job, and Enoch. What they mean to me. Okay. Uh, before we get started, I thought I'd be singing a couple hymns. But I hopefully you heeded the... We gave out a homework. <laughs> First time I've ever done it. Uh, just to warn you to look up and read up on Noah, Daniel, Job, and Enoch. Okay. But I wanted to start this with a couple hymns. I'm going to start it with, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Because when it comes to Noah, Daniel, Job, and Enoch, you know who the most important person is to us? Enoch. We're going to get into that. But I wanted to sing some hymns. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of His resurrection share. When His chosen ones are gathered to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the Master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all His wondrous love and care. Then when life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the Master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all His wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Brothers and sisters Christ, we're going to be talking about Noah. We're going to be talking about Daniel. We're going to be talking about Job. But Enoch's the number one person you need to be focused on for the subject matter that we're going to be talking about. All right? Brothers and Christ, we're supposed to be living and looking for that blessed hope, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, another hymn I'd like to sing real quick is called, I Want to Stroll Over Heaven With You. I want our mindset to be on the catching way of the body of Christ. When we go through this study, we're going to be talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. And today, brethren, are getting so distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble. So we're going to talk about it a little bit. For those who don't want to get saved today, what they're going to have to look forward to when they go through the time of Jacob's trouble. But as for the body of Christ, we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. The day of Christ, the day of redemption, being caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Here's another hymn that I have in here. I want to stroll over heaven with you. It's been a while for this one. If I surveyed all the good things that come to me from above, if I count all the blessings from the storehouse of love, I'd simply ask for a favor of him beyond mortal kings, and I'm sure that he'd grant it again. I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day when all our troubles and heartaches are vanished away. Then we'll enjoy the beauty where all things are new. I want to stroll over heaven with you. So many places of beauty we long to see here below, but times and treasures have kept us from making plans as you know. But come the morning of the day of Christ, together we'll stand anew while I stroll over heaven with you. 
I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day when all our troubles and heartaches are vanished away then we'll enjoy the beauty where all things are new I want to stroll over heaven with you when all our troubles and heartaches are vanished away would Paul say that the sufferings of this present world are not to be compared to the glory that awaits us. And he talks about rewards in heaven. Talks about how things that are eternal are more important than things that are temporal. Down here. We're supposed to be living for that blessed hope. Because what happens right after the blessed hope? I'm getting ahead of my stuff a little again. We're going to study, study. But the judgment seat of Christ. We're supposed to be living for Jesus Christ every day. And it gets tiresome down here, brothers and Christ. It gets tiresome. And it does. Whatever you do, don't faint, don't falter. Having done all to stand. So we're going to get into this study. Now, I mentioned uh, in the video previous, giving you guys the homework for Ezekiel 14.14, 14, and we're going to get into that. But before we get into Ezekiel 14, I believe Ezekiel, he's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. He's talking about a certain time period, and I believe it's the time of Jacob's trouble. And he mentions three types of men that are going to be going through this time period. I believe that time period is uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. You don't have to turn here, but because we've done, I put out a study of Brother in Christ did a far better job than I could, but we're just going to touch on it real quick. Why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble, and why the time of Jacob's trouble equals seven years. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, it is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The seven-year time period that's coming up is called the time of Jacob's trouble. And yes, it's only mentioned once, but the, the title for this time period, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ, is called the time of the Gentiles. Jesus calls it, Jesus calls it the time of the Gentiles. Times, I know it has an S on it, but times of the Gentiles. And then Paul says, blindness and part has happened to Israel until the time of the Gentiles be come in. Or no, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Till the time of the Gentiles is over. So that's what this time period is called. It's not called the church age. That's the wrong term. It's falsely called that. This is not called the church age. Okay? It's called the time of the Gentiles. Then that seven year period is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel 7, Daniel chapter 9, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. I was looking at my word here. It says it starts out with 70, and I kept thinking 7. But Daniel not chapter 9, verse 24, it says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring into everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So here we get, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, the Jewish people. All right. uh, Daniel Chapter 9, if you read 25 through 27, pause the video with 25 through 27, he goes through and talks about these time periods. Okay. Daniel 70th, we call it Daniel 70th week, but the Bible never calls it Daniel 70th week. So I'm correcting myself too, brother says Christ. That seven year time period is never called Daniel 70th week. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Every week is seven days, and every day equals a year. So if there's seven days in a week, each week equals seven years. And I'll get into some of the verses here in a second. But 69 weeks have been accounted for. 69 weeks have been accounted for. That 70th week hasn't been accounted for. So there's a seven year time period. And this is what I believe. That when you get to the book of Acts and you get to Stephen, some people believe a little bit after, some people believe at his death, you know, it got, the pause button got hit. But you look at the early book of Acts, they're still trying to preach the kingdom of heaven gospel. Repent and be water baptized. And you've killed, you crucified your king, but if you would repent and be water baptized and believe in him now that he's the Christ, the son of the living God, he can come back and rule and reign. He'll come back and rule and reign. That's what they were preaching. That's why they had them selling off their properties, preparing for Jesus to come back and rule and reign. But you get to Stephen in the book of Acts, he looks up and he sees Jesus not sitting at the right hand of God, standing at the right hand of God. This is That's the last chance. A brother in Christ, 33rd book, he did a great teaching on this. 
where he talks about how when Jesus came back, he's he, he went in the uh, before he died, you had the apostles all fled. They all turned on him, not turned on like rejection, but they got fearful. They wouldn't stand for him, and they all fled. So he lost his his uh, apostles, and Peter even denied the Lord three times. So he lost the apostles. Then the people turned on him. One, the, first, the week before, they're, they're screaming, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. And they've taken palm branches and put it out before him as he's riding a donkey into Jerusalem, like the prophecy said. Then the week later, they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. He lost the people. And then the, um, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees and the scribes, the ruling class, the religious ruling class, they turned on him. They even told uh, Pontius Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. His blood be upon us and our children. Right? So you had those three people, and in the book of Acts, he, he went backwards. And, okay, we, He went back to the uh, apostles, and Peter, you know, lovest thou me, he tells Peter that three times. You know, he gets the apostles to come back and accept him. The apostles go out to the people, and the people start turning back. The average people are turning back and saying, we're believing, and people are getting saved. The Jewish people, that is, in the early book of Acts. The Jewish people, are, they're coming back. They're getting saved. Then it comes to that ruling class, and that's where Stephen is preaching to that ruling class. And if they would have accepted him, Jesus would have came back. They rejected him. Okay? They rejected Jesus Christ. So what happened? That's where I believe the pause button got hit. The 69 weeks ended there, and that 70th week hasn't happened yet. That's a, it got paused for the time of the Gentiles, because now we're in the time of the Gentiles. Okay. And the latter book of Acts, you, you have it going from repent and be water baptized to repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul gets saved the kingdom of heaven gospel way, and then God reveals to him the, uh, the gospel to the Gentiles so the Gentiles can get grafted in. That's a whole other study. But the point is, is that pause button got hit and we're in the time of the Gentiles right now. For the last 2,000 years, we've been in the time of the Gentiles. When we get caught up, that pause button, the play button gets hit. We've got to finish that 70th week. Okay. Um, Ezekiel 4... Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, it says, Lie thou also upon the left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three hundred and ninety days. So, so shall thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on the right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So a day can be a year. And if there's seven days in a week, that's seven years. Now what started the Daniel 70th week is when um, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, came in and took over. That's what started it. I could be wrong, I'm sorry, correct myself. So that started a 70-year time period where they had to go into, uh, what do you call it, uh, want to use a bondage, but become, you know, they get taken over by Mystery Babylon, <laughs> uh, Nebuchadnezzar, but for 70 years. And, and at the end, towards the end, Daniel's getting these dreams, and that's where he gets the dream of the uh, 70 weeks. So when they come back and rebuild the, the temple, I guess that's when that, so, uh, that could be when the 69 weeks, the 70 weeks start. And you have 69 that are accounted for. But you see there, the Bible talks about how a day can be a year. Or a day can be 24 hours. The evening and the morning were the first day, 24 hours. Or a day can represent a year. A day can also represent a thousand years. A day is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. That's what 2 Timothy 2.15 comes in. 2 Timothy 3.16 comes in. Okay, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you study and you compare scripture with scripture, okay? So 69 weeks are accounted for, each, uh, accounted for, for and each week is seven years, seven days in a week. Which leaves us with Daniel's 70th week still to come. And that's what we're going to be talking about when we get to Ezekiel 14. 14. 
Okay, go ahead and turn there now. Ezekiel 14, 14. Daniel's seventh week still to come. The time of Jacob's trouble. The proper name and title for that time period is the time of Jacob's trouble. Now a little kick because we're going to go through this. This is also we're going to show some things where why post and mid-trib are 100% wrong. And why, number one, they hate calling that time period, that seven year time period, what the Bible calls it. The time of Jacob's trouble. Your name is no longer Jacob, but Israel. It's the time of Israel's trouble. It goes back to God finishing his dealing with the Jewish people. That's why we keep saying the time of the Gentiles, the time to get saved is now. The body of Christ leaves. It's going to be a different gospel in that time of Jacob's trouble. It's not going to be the same gospel that we have today. Okay. And because we, Bible believers, because we say it's a different gospel in this coming time period, they act like we're trying to add it today and they accuse us of works-based salvation. No, it's a future dispensation after the body of Christ leaves. Okay. But they can't stand it, the time of Jacob's trouble. And I've said this before, if you just say it the Bible way, a lot of the false doctrines, they have no foundation. They crumble. They evaporate in the air. Poof disappear we'd all have a we'd all the bible the body of christ would be in a better state if we all would just say it god's way and then rightly divide I understand i can make some mistakes some of the brethren make mistakes but the lost world hates rightly dividing this word of truth they'll take things from other dispensations this dispensation time of the gentiles uh time of jacob's trouble the next dispensation the day of the lord where he's ruling and reigning is another dispensation Okay? And they'll grab from these things and mess things up. They'll try to go under the Old Testament, another dispensation, and try to apply it to today. And they get all kinds of messed up if you don't rightly divide, if you're not dispensational. But here's the biggest thing. Today, brothers and Christ, we're justified by faith. Now we'll get into this probably in another study sometime where uh, I'm starting to believe that, because some people say it's only faith here and it's only works here and stuff like that. And I've said it before too, please understand. This correction is not just for everyone, like I just like correcting everyone else. This correction goes to me too. The more I study the book, the more I realize there's faith and works in every dispensation. But the Bible uses the word justified. That's why I'm against faith alone, because the Bible never says faith alone. It never says it. Once again, you say it the Bible way, all these false gospels, all these false doctrines, phew, they disappear. They have no foundation. They crumble into dust if you say it the Bible way. Now, the Bible way is there's faith that works in every dispensation, but how are you justified? How do you find God's grace? How are you justified? Today, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works that have before been ordained, that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. How are we justified? Paul says, today the just shall live by faith. We're justified by faith and not the works of the law. Now I'll get into this in another study, but when I'm talking about there's always works present, I'm not talking about the works of the law. By the works of the law can no man be saved. But there's times where God gives different commands apart from the, 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 law, the law. And you got to keep those. Okay? There's times where people are justified by faith with works on the side to prove their faith. And then you have some people that are justified by works and they have faith on the side in different dispensations. In some dispensations, you're, uh, you're justified by faith and works. Abraham was justified by faith and he was justified by works. He wasn't justified by the works of the law. No man can be justified by that. But God tested him. And you learn about that in the book of James. Because James is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble that we're going to get into, where there's works, you're justified by works, that's how you find God's grace. At the end, you have to endure to the end, and then you shall be saved. You're justified by works, and there's faith on the side. And he uses Abraham as an example. Abraham was justified by faith, and he was justified by works. He just wasn't justified by the works of the law. In other words, he wasn't sinlessly perfect. But God tested him when it came to giving up sacrificing his son. Okay. Whole nother study. But you see, just I want you to understand this is why I'm saying this, because 
These people that are easy believers in faith alone, free grace, faith alone in, in every dispensation. The whole Bible is faith alone in everything. When you turn to Ezekiel 14.14, 14, turn to Ezekiel 14.14 14, if you haven't already. Here it says, though, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, I believe it's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, they should be delivered but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Wait a second. Today, Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us. We're justified by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You repent, have godly sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. God is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such that be of a contrite spirit. You come to the cross broken, and having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins, throwing that old man at the foot of the cross, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, and the Bible says how he died, we're supposed to believe how he died, for our sins, ours, those who got saved, we went there personally and said, God, here's my wickedness, here's my sin, I don't deserve to go to heaven, I deserve to go to hell. Paul says, O wretched man that I am, I'm the chiefest of sinners. How he died for our sins according to the scriptures, and how he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Whoso shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You have to repent, you have to believe, and you have to confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And then Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us. We are baptized by Jesus Christ, not by water. There is no water baptism today. We're baptized by Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not getting into the Angelican where they take it too far and it becomes a flesh thing. You know, like, like they're doing cartwheels and whatnot down the aisle of these Babel buildings. No. He washes our sins away and his, he imputes His righteousness to us. It's His righteousness that saves us. But here you have it says, Their own souls by their righteousness saith the Lord God. They're not just, in other words, they're not justified by faith. They're justified by their own righteousness. Works what James is talking about in the time of Jacob's trouble. But it mentions these three men for this time period and that they should deliver their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Jump down to verse 20, Ezekiel 14, verse 20. You see it again. It says, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it... Remember, these three aren't ever together as far as the, you go back to the time period. Noah's before the flood, okay? Uh, Job, is before the, Job is before the flood. Daniel's way after the flood. And Job's supposed to be even before Day Noah, right before, way back before the flood. Okay? But he's talking about these are three types of people that are going to be in a certain time period having to go through something together. I believe it's the time of Jacob's trouble. But it says, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. This is important. We'll get into it later. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. They're going through a time period where they're justified by their works. There's faith on the side, but they're justified by their works. And I'll give a good example again about the faith and works always being there. People say, well, what about Adam and Eve? Well, they had to believe God when he said, If ye eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. They had to have some faith that what he said he would, would happen, would happen. They even feared it after they failed and ate from the tree. They hid from the Lord. So faith was there, but what were they justified? Works. What was the works? Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as long as they didn't do that, they had right to the tree of life, eternal life. When they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what did God say? Jesus Christ saying, he's saying, they become as one of us. And now is he going to eat from the tree of life? No. They were kicked out of the garden. They were their, their eternity, everlasting life, God's grace, was based off being justified by works. Not faith, but I believe a little. Faith had to be there. They had to believe that when God said, this is it, this is it. They had to believe God's words. 
Now don't get me wrong, Adam got to see God create things right in front of him. You know, he got to see a lot of things. But there's still a little bit of faith, I believe. Okay? But here in this dispensation, it says they, they'll deliver but their own souls by their righteousness. Their works are what that justifies them. Now there's two things here. That's why, one, that's why the body of Christ can't be going through the time of Jacob's trouble. Because we're not justified by our own righteousness. There's none righteous, no, not one. Talking about the Levitical laws. Talking about, you know, our own works. Okay, not of works, lest any man should boast. Remember we read, uh, I quoted that from uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Okay, not by works. N not, uh, let's see, for by grace are you saved, and not of yourselves, not of yourselves, and not by works. Now granted, in this time period, it's not about works of the law, but it is of themselves. There's extra commands God gives that if you fail these commands, you're toast. There is no saving. You will not get God's grace. All right. Now, what about Enoch? You say, you mentioned Enoch. We'll get to Enoch at the end because this is what I want to end it with is what we're supposed to really be focused on. But you got these people that are easy believism, okay, that they refuse to get truly saved the proper way. They take repentance. They preach a repentless gospel. They take out prayer. It's always about earning salvation. It's something they did that got them saved. It's their faith that saved them. You've got the false Catholic Church and all these false uh, religions out there that teach you have to merit salvation. Be worthy of God's grace. You have to earn it. And any way you try to make it, when you make it about what I did that saved me, you know what I've learned? It's about justifying sin and wickedness. It is. I've earned this. I've earned the right to sin. I've earned the right to do things my way. That's what it's all about. And I, I speak from experience as a false convert that got uh, in this false system of easy believism, faith alone. Okay, God's grace is what saves, and it costs something. It costs God His Son on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There is no remission of sins. You refuse to repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you, and get that free gift, and that free gift is eternal life. That's the salvation, eternal life. That gift is a free gift. But God's grace costs something. It didn't cost me something, but it costs something. It costs God the Father, His Son. And I've taught this so many times, but the thing is, is, I had a sister in Christ say, you know the number one people are going to be going into this time period that will take the mark? And, and I kind of agree with her. Some of them might have their eyes opened, but she says the faith alone people. All this organized religion, they're going to be the first ones to take that mark and worship the beast. There's a lot of truth in that, okay? especially in the Bible. That, that, they believe, that they should believe a lie who all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Like I said, all these false gospels, including easy believism, a repentantless gospel, is all about justifying sin and making up for sin and saying I have the right to sin and live however I want to live. I've earned it. I've earned the right. No, you haven't. Right? Someone who's truly saved and born again, Paul says, you're not your own, you're bought with a price. You present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We're supposed to be walking after Christ and in Christ, doing things God's way. Not our way. Not the world's way. Definitely not Satan and, the end, Satan and his ministers, the enemy, the three enemies. Okay. Enoch, uh, he's the most important of the body of Christ. Now in the time of Jacob's trouble, salvation will based, be based off on works with faith on the side. Uh... You know the churches in Revelation, I know thy works. Once the, one of these days we'll get around to doing it. I want to do a marker board and show how I believe most of those churches because it's a revelation that's being given to Paul. And there's churches that are, for, that are in the Pauline epistles that aren't even mentioned. So what are these churches? They're churches in the time of Jacob's trouble, going into the day of the Lord go, and making it through the day of the Lord. Some of them make it through the day of the Lord, going into when Satan's let loose for a season. Because one of them you have to have right to the tree of life. We don't need the tree of life. We have Jesus Christ. He is our life. He that hath the Son hath life. 
He that hath not the Son hath not life. These things that are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. We get our life from Jesus Christ, not from the tree of life. All right. So let's start with the first one, Noah. Let's start with the first one, Noah. I believe, and here's the thing, for this whole study in the comment section, please put down some things that I might have left out that you said, well, what about this correlation between Noah and the time of Jacob's trouble, or Daniel in the time of Jacob's trouble, or Job in the time of Jacob's trouble, because I might miss some. I just kind of put this together, and I'll keep adding to it over the years. But if you also disagree a little bit, go ahead. Like I said, don't make it like this is written in stone. What I'm saying here is not worth breaking fellowship, because that seven-year time period isn't our dispensation. Now, don't get me wrong, I will, what is worth breaking fellowship is you get across somebody who says, oh no, the body of Christ goes through there. Basically, they're attacking the true plan of salvation then, because in that time period, you have to justify your, you have to save your own soul by your own righteousness. It's works in there. You're not sealed in that time period. And that's the reason why that sister in Christ said they'll take the mark of the beast and worship, worship the beast in a heartbeat, because... If you go in there thinking faith alone, and I'm sealed, and it's just faith alone in that time period, you'll do anything. You'll compromise and say, well, you know, God will forgive me. I've made that mistake. Even in my walk with the Lord today, where there's times where you compromised, and in the back of your head you said, well, I, I know I shouldn't do this, but, you know, God will forgive me. And that time period, He won't. Today He will. Repent. Forsake. Get your heart right with the Lord. Uh, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me, Jesus says. And get back to your walk with the Lord. In that time period, you take the mark, you worship the beast, there is no forgiveness. You've basically denied Jesus Christ permanently when you take that mark and worship the beast. So in this study, like I said, don't get bent out of shape if you go, oh, I don't really agree with that. It's not my dispensation. What's important is Enoch, and we'll get to Enoch. But this is just talking about those that go in, that refuse to get saved the Bible way, who attack true biblical repentance as it applies to salvation, and prayer, even taking prayer out, who, who attack the changed life gospel, get, being a new creature in Christ Jesus, the new birth. They attack it by changing what it is, or just saying they're, they're, it, does, it doesn't have to be there. They're going to be going into this time period, and this is what you're going to have to go through. And we're going to be going through it. Noah, Daniel, Job. So Noah. I believe Noah represents the 144,000 Jews that are sealed in their forehead in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, I had a brother in Christ that he did what seemed like a good study at the time. At the time, I thought it was a great study. But the more I studied, the more I realized he did a study trying to say that Noah represents the body of Christ being caught up. And he's 100% wrong. Noah does not represent the body of Christ. Does not represent the catching away. Noah never got caught up to heaven. He still had to go through the flood. As we're going to go through this. He had to go through the flood. But what was the difference between Noah going through the flood and everyone else that went through the flood? Noah had God's protection. We'll get into this, but I believe Noah represents the 144,000 Jews that are sealed in their forehead in the time of Jacob's trouble. Genesis 6-9. Genesis 6-9. Make sure you get your, I forgot to say this earlier, get out your King James Bibles. Okay? Uh, we got so much to go through, so I put this right here. We're going to go through it. Pause the video and turn. You know the, you know the drill, Brother Sis Christ. I love the Lord. I love His Word. I love my Brother Sis Christ. And I just, I love Scripture. We use a lot of Scripture. So Noah... I believe equals the 144,000 Jews that are sealed in their forehead in the time of Jacob's trouble. Genesis 6-9 says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. Okay. Now, I believe in the time of Jacob's trouble, those 144,000 Jews are going to be Jews that are still faithful to the Old Testament. For the most part. For the most part. You have two types of Jews today. You've got what we call the Orthodox Jews, the Jews that actually believe in the Old Testament. They're not doing everything like this. The animal sacrifices were taken away because God took them away. But they're doing their best to, to hold to the Old Testament. And blindness in part has happened to them, and, and they reject Jesus Christ today. They reject Jesus Christ. When we go into that time period, not we, but 
when they go into that time period, I slipped up and said, we, forgive me. When they go into that time period, okay, that's who they're going to be. But then you have the Zionist Jews, which I believe are, they think, well, Zionist just means you believe that, you, that the Jews have a right to own their own land. There's a lot more to Zionist Jews than that. The Zionist Jews are actually Jews that are working hand in hand with the Vatican. They're traitors. Okay? They're worldly. They've added tons of books to the Old Testament attacking Jesus Christ, blaspheming Jesus Christ and who he is. Okay? And they're working for the Vatican over in Israel because of the Zionist Jews who believe that the Jews, they don't believe the Jews should have their own land because over in Israel, over a third of Israel is owned, probably more now, is owned by the Vatican. Catholic Rome. And then there's a lot of it that's owned by the Muslims. And the Jews are a small minority that own very little of Israel. What happened to, the, to Zionists believing that Jews have the right to, to own their own? They don't. They don't. Whole nother discussion. But you have two types of Jews. Daniel is one type, the Zionist Jews. And I believe Noah is the Jews, that are, the Orthodox Jews, that are being faithful to the Old Testament. Okay. So you have Noah walked with God. Uh, Noah chosen by God, sealed and commanded to build the ark. Uh, pause the video after I say this. Uh, Genesis 6, 13, 18. Read that. Pause. If you didn't, go ahead and brush up and you just come across this video. Pause and read Genesis 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 13 through 18. Okay? You see him talking about how he tells Noah that, hey, you found favor in my eyes and I'm going to protect you through the flood. And he's teaching him how to build the ark. God is teaching him how to build the ark. Okay. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 11 through 17, pause the video again and read it if you have it. This is Noah to, is protected by God in the ark. God closes the door of the ark, and God is protecting Noah through the flood, just as God's going to be protecting those 144,000 Jews that are sealed in their forehead through the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. Now, Jews are sealed. Revelation chapter 7. The Jews are sealed. Revelation chapter 7. Remember today, grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. And that book has a seal, and it takes Jesus Christ, and Revelation takes Jesus Christ in heaven when John's up there. Jesus, it takes Jesus Christ to break the first seal that unleashes the man of sin, the son of perdition on the world, and we get caught up. We're sealed into the day of redemption. Okay? In that time period, the only people that are sealed is what we're going to read about right here. Chapter 7, uh, Revelation chapter 7, 2 through 8. Pardon me, give me a second. Sorry about that. Verse 2 says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in our forehead. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were 144,000 of Jehovah's Witness. No. Jehovah's Witness are closet Catholics. But they don't believe Jesus is God and all other kind of problems. But one of the things they teach is this 144,000 is, is sealed Jews in the past that got caught up in the past. Okay. No, what does it say? And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of, the, the, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. What is post-trib and mid-trib? It's replacement theology. When, they, when Jehovah's Witnesses are saying the 144,000 are chosen Jehovah's Witnesses, what is it? It's replacement theology. They're saying that, the, that they've replaced the Jews, and they're stealing from the Jews. Thousand of the tribes of the children of Israel, of the tribe of Judah, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of the Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephilim were sealed... Tw or, yeah, Neph Nephilim is what it says. There was... Or, I, I kind of say it wrong, but. Nep, Thalem, I guess. Thalem. 
were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. What are these? The 12 patriarchs, the 12 sons of Jacob, the time of Jacob's trouble. Your name's no longer Jacob, but Israel. Okay. How far are we going? Just to eight. Okay, so there it is. So you have the Jews that are sealed. You say, what's the big deal? It says, hurt not the earth till they say, what's the big deal? They've got to be sealed so they can be protected. When they're sealed, they're protected. Turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. You read one through fifth. Uh, uh, read Revelation chapter nine, verse one through nineteen. Pause the video and read verses one through nineteen. Okay. But when you get to verse four, it says Revelation nine four, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. These are these animals that are coming out of the pit, and they sting men. You know. You know. They, they, they seek death, which is future. We're going to get back to that one. But they seek death and they don't find it. But these people that have the seal, this 140,000 Jews, they're protected by God. Okay. Revelation 12, 14 reads, Revelation 4, 12, 14 we read, And to the woman were given two wings of great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. They're protected. Uh, another great example of this, uh, Matthew. Remember Job. Not Job. We're not talking about Job. Noah. Forgive me. Noah. The flood's coming. God teaches him how to build the ark. Commands him to build the ark. There's faith in works, but he's justified by what? Works. If Noah never built the ark, guess what? He's going to drown along with everyone else. He had to have faith in God, and the works... Or what justified it? He built the ark. And everyone went in. God closed the door. It flooded. The ark was raised up with the water. And he was protected. And it reminds me of a story in Matthew chapter 14, 22. We talked about this recently in another study. But Matthew 14, 22. I love how the Bible, you know, the stories of the Bible when it comes to instruction and righteousness, they, there's so much to get from the Word of God, from the same story. Just don't misuse it. I, I, I failed on misusing. Don't, don't take things out of context. Okay. Matthew 14, 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go to, before him unto the other side. While he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossing with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Okay. But Noah was in the ark, and God was protecting him. He did not have the fear that the, the rest of the world was going through. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, where didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, so God, so Jesus takes, I want to make sure, I keep peas, Paul, Peter, Paul, Peter, peas. Um, Peter, he takes him out of the water and puts him on the ship. What did God do to Job? He made it so he didn't have to go through the water and put him on a ship. And then the wind ceased. Then they were in the ship and came to worship him, saying, Of the truth, thou art the Son of God. Just as Jesus saved Peter from sinking in the water, because the water is the type of the world, Peter got distracted by the world and got scared. And Jesus saved him and put him on the ship. Now, I bet you when 
Um, I want to bet. But you read Noah, when he was told of what was going to happen, he was a little bit fearful. And God taught him how to build the ark and assured him, and he had faith. And there was works. Mm -hmm. Just as Jesus saved Peter from sinking in the water and putting it on the boat, God saved Noah from being destroyed in the water by putting him in the ark and closing the door. So will Jesus, who is God, save the 144,000 Jews that are sealed in their forehead from taking the mark and worshiping the beast. Okay. Another thing that also kind of touches into Noah versus the Jews uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. Revelation chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman that brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that he might fly into the wilderness, into their place, where she is nursed for a time and times and half a times from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So you got people that are being saved, running to the wilderness, and then you got people that are having to really deal with this, this dragon, you know, Mystery Babylon. The false prophet, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, and the red dragon. Okay? But there's a flood there. People say, well, what's Satan doing? That's the dragon doing it. Who unleashes Satan on the world? God does. Who unleashed the flood on the world? God does. We're going to get to this. When we get to Job, we'll be talking about you know how God starts it, God ends it. Okay, good relation to it. But you see they're the flesh. Okay? That you have a type of Jews that are being taken care of, and then you have a type of Jews that are being persecuted hardcore. I believe it's two different groups. Which brings us to Daniel. I mean, there's probably a lot more that I, I left out when it comes to comparing Noah to the Jews that are sealed in their forehead. If I have, put it in the comment section. But I believe that Noah represents the Jews that are sealed. But then it brings us to Daniel, those Jews that aren't sealed. That's what Daniel, I believe, represents. Where he's actually in the thick of it. He's not being protected. He doesn't have that seal. He has to go through it along with the Gentiles. Okay. So Daniel, I believe, equals the Jews that do not have the seal in the time of Jacob's trouble. They're not that 144,000. Okay? Daniel chapter 10, verse 11. Daniel chapter 10, verse 11, we read. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Now the part I want to get out of there is, a man greatly beloved. Paul talks about this, the Jews being beloved for the Father's sake. In Romans chapter 11, verse 28, we read, As concerning the gospel, they, talking about the Jewish people, are enemies for your sakes. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. That blindness is going to, that part is going to be done away with in the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm getting ahead of myself again, but there's going to be two witnesses that opens their eyes to who Jesus really is. But right now, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Be careful when people try to say there's no more Jews anymore, the church has, repl the church has replaced the Jews. That's a lie. That's a total lie. Once again, you're dealing with Satanism because Satan is trying to do away with the Jews. So another thing that going back to that Zionist Jews where they're, they're working hand in hand with the Catholic Church and on one side the Catholic Church is trying to use the Muslims and the world to destroy the Jews and wipe them out and on the other hand they're like, we're your friend! They're playing both sides. Okay. There's two types of Jews and these Jews are going to get their eyes opened by the two witnesses. Okay. The Jews that don't have the seal on their forehead. Matthew 24, 22 says, and except those days be shortened, there shall be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. What's the elect here? It's not talking about the election of the gospel, how the gospel, the way we get saved today, was planned from the very beginning. And there's times where the election is talking about the gospel, how we get saved today. No, this elect is talking about the Jewish people. They were chosen. Abraham was chosen. Okay? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve patriarchs. Unless those days been shortened, 
no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Remember the ones that have the seal on their forehead? They don't need to be shortened. They're, they're sealed by God. They're protected by God. But these Jews, they're going to have to go through it just like the regular Gentiles and have to deal with mystery Babylon. Okay? So here's this, let's look at some comparisons to Daniel, what he went through, and what's going on in the time of Jacob's trouble, these Jews that don't have the seal on their forehead. Okay? Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, we read, and the first, uh, Daniel dreams dreams and sees visions. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 says, In the first year of Be Belteshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions. Why is this important? We'll get to that in just a second. Of his head upon his bed, and he wrote the dreams and told the sum of the matter. And you read about those dreams, future prophecies. But he had dreams and visions. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, we read, remember they're preaching the kingdom of heaven gospel, in the early book of Acts, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will, last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Okay, so you have dreams, and visions coming back in the time of Jacob's trouble, I believe, and you had it there in Daniel's time. I mean, there's dreams and visions all throughout the Bible, but I'm talking about we're comparing these men to that time period that they're in, the time of Jacob's trouble. What about Jerusalem is occupied and taken over and looted, and in Jerusalem, or in Jeremiah, they are fleeing. In Jeremiah 42, you can read that, chapter 42, verse 1. He's warning them not to flee to Egypt. They're being told to stay there, and they end up going back to the world. So you have Jews that were told to stay and dwell in the land, wherever they're at, and trust the Lord. Don't go back to the world. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you've got a choice to make. Take the mark of the beast, go back to the world, or flee. Mm -hmm. But Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, we read, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. In the time of Jacob's trouble, remember, God's the one that unleashes the man of sin, the son of perdition, that Antichrist that shall come. He's opening the seals. He's dumping out the vials. He's the one that's take, take, as, do, as, as letting that time period come, just as he did here. Okay. There's nothing that's ever happening that God looks at and goes, Oops, that's a mistake. I didn't want that to happen. That shouldn't have happened. No. There's times where God will stop something from happening. There's times where God will allow it to happen for his glory. Okay. God knows what he's doing, brothers says Christ. In other words, he knows what he's doing. He's in charge. God gave the city... Where, where Daniel goes in to bondage, becomes a bond servant. Okay? Same thing's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. Especially when you have the people saying, we have no king but Caesar. Okay? The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands, in his hands, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his gods. Okay. So, uh, turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, where the post-tribbers love to go to Matthew 24, but they can't find Paul preaching that we're going through that time period in the Pauline epistles. They can't find a brother of Christ told me, he's like, here's a good one. Show me where Paul warns us about not taking the mark of the beast. Isn't that a big deal? If, if the body of Christ is supposed to go through that time period, do you think Paul would warn us about not taking the mark and worshiping the beast? Where is he doing that? He's clear to say, we're not going through that time period. That, that day should not overtake you as a thief in the night. We're not going through that time period. It's not for us. But Matthew 24, the Sermon on the Mount, is for the Jewish people who go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew 24, 15 through 18. So you hear, here you see that, that Nebuchadnezzar, who's a type of, they call him a type of Antichrist, he takes over Israel. Okay? 
He takes over Jerusalem. Here, 15, in the time of Jacob's trouble, you got that man of sin. He takes over. He sets himself up as God. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, we're talking about Daniel, the prophet, stand in the holy place. He comes in, I'm your friend with these Zionist Jews. I'm your friend and everything. And they accept him at first. Some continue to accept him all the way to the end. But some, you have the two witnesses wake them up and say, hey, this isn't right. And this man's going to take over Jerusalem. He's going to take over the temple. He's going to take, try to take over Israel. When ye therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. How far are we going? 28. It's a long ways. And let him which be at the housetops not come down to take away things out of his house. When it's time to run, you run. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck on those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is for the Jews. Watch out for any false religion that tries to bring the Sabbath day today and make it a, an ordinance where we have to keep the Sabbath day today. No, we don't. No, we don't. Okay. Neither on the Sabbath day. It's talking about the Jewish people. For then, shall be, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, no, nor ever shall be. Once again, shall be, shall be great tribulation. You have the post tribbers they'll try to grab this to change the name, the title for that 70 year time period that God chose. God chose the time of Jacob's trouble. And what they do? We don't like that because it's too obvious it's about the Jewish people. We don't like that. So what are we going to do? We need to change that title. We're going to call it the Great Tribulation. And we're going to use this verse and see, see, the title for that time period is the Great Tribulation. What did we just read there? For then shall be Great Tribulation. It's a description. It's not a title. Don't fall for that. Okay. Once again, you read the Bible as it is, and these false teachings, no foundation. They disappear. Now, you can keep reading all the way to 28, but he's talking about it. Oh, uh, that's where we get, except those days shall be shortened. Let's see, neither on the Sabbath day. Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake shall those days be shortened. Then if any man say, Lo unto you, say unto you, Lo, here is Christ. Or there, believe it not. Right? We won't be there to warn them. We're going to get into those verses. We won't be there to warn them. So you're going to have people telling them, Hey, there's Christ, that man of sin, the son of perdition. Believe him not. For there shall rise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that it were possible they should deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you this before. And it keeps going through, talking about the thing. But you see there, they're fleeing. Somebody takes over, and they're fleeing. And these are the Jews. It's talking about Jewish people. So Daniel, they had to do it. Matthew, they're doing it in the time of Jacob's trouble. The Jews will have their wealth stolen. Notice what they had their temple looted. Now, and, uh, and Daniel, they went in and, and eventually destroyed the temple completely and looted it completely. But the Jews will have their wealth stolen. And Nebuchadnezzar had a statue built that they all had to worship and go through the fire. Hmm. If they didn't worship it, they'd have to go through the fire. Daniel 3, uh, Daniel chapter 3, 1 through 7, if you want to pause the video and read that, there's the statue and the order to worship it or go through the fire. And there's where you have Shad, if you get to 8 through 30, Daniel chapter 3, verse 8 through 30, there's where you read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to worship the image, refusing to take the mark and worshiping the beast in the time of Jacob's trouble. For Revelation 13, turn to Revelation 13, 15. So if you want to pause the video and read Daniel chapter 3, 1 through 30, you get the story about how he's building a statue and everyone's commanded to bow down to it and worship it. 
And if you don't worship it, you get thrown in the fiery furnace. And you have three Jewish men refusing to worship it. And they get thrown in the fiery furnace. All right. they, get they get protected, <laughs> but these Jews, uh, they're going to have to go, you know, might even have to give their lives for it. Revelation, no beheaded. We'll get to that. But Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. It was brought to life. Remember we've read over here? For there shall rise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall delete, deceive the very elect. The image of the beast should be killed. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. That the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many would not worship the image or the beast should be killed. Verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their hand and in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that have the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now you say, what is that talking about with wealth stolen? Well, we talked about the statue, and we just compared it, but what about the wealth? I'm going to get into this a little bit more when we get into Job, but today, everything is based off the monetary system. Here in America, if in my situation, we'll talk a little bit about it now. In my situation right now, just in America, if I could no longer use currency, I'd lose everything. In that time period, you cannot buy or sell, say, they who have the mark. I have to pay taxes to live here. I lose my land. I have to pay, use money to pay for electricity. I have to use money to pay for internet. You have to use money to pay for food. My car. You think, well, it's your car, it's your car. I have to pay money to register it so I can use it. I have to pay and, and renew my driver's license every so many years. It costs money. You will end up losing everything. They're going to have everything stolen from them. All right. Daniel is also tested with staying clean. Goes back to those um, the statues there. You saw Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were tested. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, they're not going to be protected in the fiery furnace. They're going to be killed. They have to be faithful unto death. Which we're, we're going to read a little bit. So Daniel chapter 1.8 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Some say the king's meat and wine was offered under false gods. That being said, in the time of Jacob's trouble, to buy meat or wine, you need to take the mark and worship the beast. And there's going to be a lot of false god worship going on. Could some of those foods still be offered unto idols? Uh, like I said, but you still have to, in order to get the food and meat, you have to defile yourself. He's saying, I'm not going to defile myself with this meat. It's offered unto false gods. Okay. Or this wine. Okay. Plus, it's unclean meat. Sometimes it can be simply something that's unclean meat, because the Jews, today, there's, there's no, we can eat anything. We don't have the touch not, taste not, eat not ordinances that are in the Old Testament. Okay. The Levitical laws. But the Jews don't hold to the New Testament. They simply hold to the Old Testament. Luke 22.31 reads, Luke 22.31 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. The point for this verse here, Satan hath a desire to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Daniel didn't want to um, purpose his heart that he wouldn't defile himself in the time of Jacob's trouble. We read verses. Satan's going to be going after the Jewish people to destroy them. Because that Daniel's 70th week has to come through. 
So that 70th week of, of 70 weeks are determined upon thy people that was revealed to Daniel. That 70th week has to happen. And if it doesn't happen and God does not fulfill all his, pro his prophecies and his promises, Satan's trying to make God out to be a liar. He's got to wipe out those Jews. He's going to really be going after those Jews in that time period. And he's not allowed to touch the ones that have the mark in their forehead. So he's going after the ones that don't have the mark. That's what I believe. But we'll find out. We'll be, we'll be watching from up there and looking down. Okay? But, but just similarities of what you're going to have to go through. These people who won't get saved today, what you're going to have to go through in that time period. You're going to lose everything. But we're going to get to, I'm going to go through it more in Job, which we're getting to right now. Okay? Now, the story... Uh, right here it says, Satan deserved to, to sift you as wheat. I left a part out. The reason I used this verse was because, remember the story of Peter, how he was among the enemies of Jesus. When he was up there, the, the, the ruling class and some of the people that were there, he was among enemies of Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He ended up denying Jesus Christ three times. Now God forgave him. Peter, lovest thou me? You got that story where he says it a few times. And he says that three times. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, if they deny Jesus Christ, what did they have to do to deny Jesus Christ? You take the mark and you worship the beast. Satan looks to sift them like wheat. To get them to turn on God and destroy themselves. And if they won't do it, he causes them to die. He'll put them to death himself. Right. So there's probably a lot more so if you come up with some that I didn't mention for Daniel, like I said, I believe that uh, Noah, 144,000 are sealed in their forehead. If you refuse to get saved today, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and, and ask God to save you, you're going into a time period where you're not sealed. Only that 144,000 Jews are sealed. There is no seal. There is no, I'm sealed into the day, the day of redemption has already come and gone. Now you're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. You got left behind because you were a fake and you were a fraud. You were lied to with a false gospel. That was, that's Noah. That's one of the things that these people that go into that time period are going to have to deal with. You can get saved today. Today there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, uh, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. It's talking about salvation. Jews can get saved today. Gentiles can get saved today. Anyone can get saved today. But once you go back into that time period, that time period, God's going back to dealing with the Jewish people. Now, he still throws, I believe he throws Job in there. Why? Because we're going to get into Job now. I believe Job equals the Gentiles in the time of Jacob's trouble. There are Gentiles that can get saved. At the end, you have to endure to the end, but there are Gentiles that God's not just kicking them to the curb completely, but that time period is predominantly for the Jewish people. It's going back to the kingdom of heaven gospel. It's going back to the Old Testament prophecies that he had on the Jewish people to fulfill those prophecies. So we get to Job. Job equals the Gentiles, I believe, in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, Job chapter 1 Job chapter 1. Okay, that's what it is. Job chapter 1, verse 1 through Job chapter 2, two verse 10. If you want to pause the video and read that, Job chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 10. Okay. Uh, what we're going to be talking about is what Job had to go through and what people uh, they are going to have to go through. The Gentiles are going to have to go through. Okay. And don't get me wrong, the, the, the Gentiles around the world... Okay, that's what Job is. When you got Daniel, Daniel's talking about the, the Jews around Jerusalem. All right. or in Israel, you know, the holy city around that temple that gets rebuilt. Job is going to be the Gentiles around the world, what the jo Gentiles are going to be going through. So when you read that, after Job loses his wealth and his family, so Job chapter 1 verse 20, he loses his wealth... <laughs> And he loses his family, all but his wife. So I had a brother in Christ correct me. Um, other than his wife, or maybe he did lose his wife, and his wife just happens to walk by when we get to how he lost his health. But we'll get to there, getting ahead of myself. But Job 1.20 says, 
Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. He didn't deny God. He didn't charge God foolishly, it says, and, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He stays faithful to the Lord. 22 says, And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. And after Job's health is affected, Job 2.8 and he took him a pot shard to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Curse God and die. Verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive, what? Shall we receive good at God's, at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. He didn't turn on God. What about in the time of Jacob's trouble? Losing one's wealth. Turn to Revelation chapter 13, 15. We're going to go through it again. Revelation chapter 13, 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right, their right hand or in their forehead. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Brothers and Christ, today everything is engineered. I was talking to uh, some brothers and sisters in Christ how you go back because of technology. Uh, technology is actually hurting us. And you say you're using it now. I understand. I'm, I'm talking about in the time of Jacob's trouble, technology is going to be the worst thing ever. And please hear me out. You go back a hundred years ago, people knew how to live off the land and be self-sustaining. But what's been happening over these years, as you look around, everyone is being indoctrinated into being dependent on things that require money and buying and selling. Here in America, you used to be able to own land, and if you went through hard times, you could live off the land, and you'd be just fine. But like I said before, today they, they, they went against the Constitution, they started doing taxes for land. So now you can't just live off the land. You've got to pay the government permission to use the land. You've got to pay them money to use the land. You've got to pay your taxes on land. What happens when that mark of the beast is implemented worldwide? It is a worldwide thing. We've got one world religion, one world uh, government, a one world monetary system, money system, that gets implemented worldwide. You've got to take the mark, and you've got to worship the beast if you want to buy or sell. Well, I ain't taking the mark. I ain't worshiping the beast. We're taking your land. We're taking your cars. You can't buy clothes. Well, I'll just make my own. How many people know how to make their own clothes? When's the last time? I mean, it's average. You're talking with people and they're saying, Oh, yeah, I had to make this shirt. Yeah, I made this shirt. Sometimes you might come across them. There's a difference between like someone taking a shirt that's already made uh, and, and um, modifying it and saying, Hey, I made this. But I'm talking about like they made the whole shirt itself from scratch. They made jeans for themselves from scratch. They don't. They buy them. You can't buy clothes anymore. How many of you, I have a garden here. Some still have small gardens, but, you know, you really got to know, I've been learning a little bit about the seeds, you know, how to get seeds from the plants that are there, but most people that have gardens, what do they do? They buy seeds. You can't buy seeds anymore. Why? Because you have to have that mark and you have to worship the beast. It's going to be a system that's going to be put out saying you have to take this mark and worship the bees to buy and sell. And once they get it really, I believe once they get it really, it's going to come out just maybe slightly a little bit later, where they're going to say, okay, first we're throwing this out there because they're going to use it to solve everyone's problems. And then they're going to come and say, now if you don't take it, we're going to kill you. This should, should be killed. But you lose everything. Job lost everything. And what do you do? He remained faithful. You're going to end up losing everything. Today, 
People are so used to AC units that takes electricity. They're used to electric heaters. Not many people have wood stoves. And you can still cut down some trees for, for a wood stove, but most people today buy their wood. Especially if you're elderly, you can't get out there and cut down your wood anymore. You have to buy. You're going to lose everything. And when you lose everything, you're going to be tested. Don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. You do that, you're done. There is no coming back from that. Okay, what about losing one's family? He lost his children. Revelation 6.4, Revelation 6.4 says, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword, that they would kill one another. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, gets mis misused a lot because he's trying to apply it to today. It's not for today. It's for, I believe, it's for the time of Jacob's trouble. But Matthew 10, 34, it was where Jesus was there, because they were all fearful, if you read about it, when Jesus was there, they were all fearful of the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes because they said that anybody that would accept Jesus as the Christ would be kicked out of the synagogue. Okay? They were fearful and hit their time. But predominantly, this, I believe, is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. Think not that I came to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother-in-law, mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Now, I put this under uh, Job, but this could also be related to Daniel when it comes to the Jewish people. If, you have, if you're Jewish, you go into that time period, and you have a mother that took the mark and worshipped the beast and didn't run with you. Remember, they were running. They didn't run with you. They stayed behind. They're now the enemy. And they look at you as the enemy. And they'll turn you in in a heartbeat. But mainly around the world, you're going to have people that if they take the mark and they worship the beast, they're now the enemy. You're going to have people turn on you. Job 2.9 Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. His wife turned on him. Curse God and die. And you see these people that took the mark and they worshiped the beast. I got finished listening to Revelation today. Get to the end and it's like they see all the stuff that God's doing. They're cursing God. The ones that took the mark and worshiped the beast. His wife didn't stay faithful to God. She took off. And his wife turned on him and tried to get him to turn on God. Those around you that have taken the mark and worshipped the beast will now see you and anyone that has not taken the mark and worshipped the beast as the enemy and will turn you in. And we'll get to this part. Job didn't lose his life, but you'll lose your life for not taking the mark of the beast in that system. But Job wished losing one's life. Job 3.1. Job chapter 3 verse 1. After this opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, There is a man-child conceived. Job chapter 10, verse 18, we read, Wherefore then hast thou brought me forth out of the womb? Oh, that I had, been, that I had given up the ghost, and no eye hath seen me. I should have been as though as I have not been. I should have been carried from the womb, to the grave. In Revelation 9, 6, what he's going through, when people go through it, you have to give up everything. You're on the run now, because you said, no, I'm not going to take it, so you end up losing everything. And then they're saying, okay, on top of that, if you don't take it, we'll kill you. Now they're on the run. They're on the run not from this false one world system. They're on the run from, from family members that took the mark and worshipped the beast. Loved ones. And Revelation 9, 6 says, and that time period is going to be horrible. It's going to be hard to get through that time period. Revelation 9, 6, and in those days shall men seek death, time of Jacob's trouble, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now, if you read the context once again, it's talking about those animals that sting them. They, they get, there's a certain period where they're allowed to sting them, and they're going to wish that they were dead. Now, there's people that die. The Bible talks about in Revelation. There's people that die. But this short time period here reminds me of, of him wishing he was dead. But he's not. 
That's how difficult that time period is going to be. You get to Matthew. If, uh, when we talked about Matthew, where I, I came not to send peace but a sword, where you have your, your family turning against you, you lose your family. But here you can lose your life based on your family. Matthew 10, 37. Oh, it's my daughter. She wouldn't turn me in. Oh, it's my son. He would. Yes, they will. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, today we compromise sometimes. We shouldn't for, for daughters, for wives, for husbands, for family members. We compromise and we shouldn't. And God can forgive us. And that time period you compromise, what's the compromise? Oh, I guess they did it, I'll do it. I'll take the mark of the beast and worship the beast. My life is miserable as it is. I wish I was dead. The other compromise, uh, when if you try to compromise, oh, it's my daughter and son, they'll turn you in. I still won't take the mark away. They'll turn you in and you'll be beheaded. You'll be killed. It's not worthy of me. That's what I believe this verse is talking about. Verse 38, And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Paul talks about today for us, spiritually, we're supposed to be a living sacrifice. Right? And that time period, you might actually become a physical sacrifice, giving your life uh, for keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he that taketh not up his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Well, how do you find your life in the time of Jacob's trouble? You want your life back? You want all this back? Just take the mark and worship the beast. He that findeth his life shall lose it. But he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. I lost everything. Why? Because I won't take the mark and worship the beast. I've lost everything. Why? For Jesus Christ. Keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's going to cost you your life. You're not just going to lose your family, but you might lose your life. Job despaired of life and death. Ezekiel 14.20 Once again, it says, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. The reason I put that there is it reminded me when I was reading that again. Remember Job, verse 1, going all the way back to chapter, I mean, chapter 1, verse 5. And it was so, when the days of their fat, feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them. Who's them? His children. And rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. It won't be like that in the time of Jacob's trouble. See, we read the Bible today where it talks about parents, you know, that you have one believing parent. Let's say the wife is saved. The husband says, Okay, I'm willing to dwell with you. I'm willing to live the way you're living. The children are sanctified by the parents. Not so in that time period. It's every man for himself. And we read here, if I'm still on here, yeah, it says, Woe to them that give suck in those days, and woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. It's going to be every man, woman for themselves. As far as if they take the mark, they worship the beast, they're now the enemy. And we are perceived, those who don't take the mark and worship these, now we're perceived as enemies. Right? It's not going to be like that, like it was. Like it is today a little bit, when we read about that, about parents versus children, and like it was in the Old Testament with the Jews. It's not going to be that way anymore. John 16.2 John 16.2 says, They shall put you out of the synagogue, yea, the time cometh that whosoever, whosoever shall... Well, whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. They put you out of the synagogues? You mean the man of, in the time of Jacob's trouble, the man of sin takes over? Now, I granted that in the early book of Acts, this applies. They were being kicked out of the synagogues. But for what we're talking about here, in the time of Jacob's trouble, they take over. 
that one world religion takes over. And there's people that kill you thinking they do God's service. Now we've seen some of this in the time of the Gentiles, but it's going to be hardcore in, in the uh, time of Jacob's trouble. And that's of your time period. Revelation 20, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and there and they sat upon them, and a judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. No one said that they'll kill them if they don't take the mark and worship the beast. They call it, they'll kill them all. This is them, I believe. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Remember, there's two parts there. I believe there's some people they're going to kill that are going to be like these new age people that are, I, don't, I, have, I want nothing to do with Jesus Christ, but I ain't taking that mark and worshiping the beast. Okay, kill them, and they behead them. That's not these guys. You have to have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Keep his commandments by not taking the mark and worship the beast, and you have to have the testimony. We're beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, the commandment of God. Don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hand, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You have people that die for Jesus Christ in that time period, refusing to take that mark and worship the beast. Job longed for death. So you either have to sometimes, when you get put face up to it, you either, uh, you either, I think, I didn't put that in the, in the verses. So please correct me, brother, says Christ. I know some of you are amazing. You follow along in the scriptures. I thought there was supposed to be like a, a, a grace period. It's not a grace period. We call it grace period. But what it is, is it's a period to get people to turn on God and take the mark and worship the beast. So they'll capture you. There's a 10 day, I think it was like 10 days and then you're beheaded. If you don't take the mark and worship the beast, you're beheaded. Job is sitting there and he's wishing that, that he, he, would, he would die, but he still refused to take the mark of the beast. In that time period, I mean, he refused to turn on God. In that time period, you take the mark, you worship the beast, you're turning on God. And if you refuse to do it, you're going to be killed. There's the comparison. Uh, Revelation. Okay. Revelation chapter 9. Today, you can, today, brothers and Christ, for the time of the Gentiles, we can be martyred for Jesus Christ. Absolutely. We can end up being killed for Jesus Christ. But our salvation is sealed. Whether we live or die, our salvation is sealed. We're sealed. Us dying is not going to determine whether we, we, get, we, get to, we get eternal life. There's brethren that live to be old and die old men. There's brethren that are saved and within like, like the next... I mean, saved and the week later they, they die. They, they're killed as martyrs in the past. Our salvation is not based off of dying for Jesus Christ. But in this time period, it will be. You get captured, they give you 10 days trying to get you to... Uh, recant <laughs> to get you to take the mark of the beast take the mark of the beast you you have to say no I won't take it and you have to die because if you take it you can't get saved what about losing one's health hopefully you read about Job when he had boils and he lost his health Revelation chapter 9 1 through 19 pause the video and read Revelation chapter 9 1 through 19 what we're going to end up reading now is we're going to read uh, chapter, uh, verse 20, Revelation 9, 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils or idols of gold or silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor their thefts. You have plagues. Now I understand some plagues can be simply fire being rained down, but if you remember in Egypt, they had boils. Remember what happened to Job? His physical health was affected to also get him down to turn against God. You think it's bad enough that you have to give up all this stuff and you might have to go out there and some people say, well, I can do it. I can go out there and I can live bushcraft. I can live out in the boonies and everything. Try doing it 
with be, while you're being plagued with plagues. A third of the trees are being burnt up. All that smoke is going to affect your lungs. Your health isn't going to be the best. You're not only just going through. It's one thing for, like today you have people go out there, I'm going to show you how to build a little, you know, in-ground shelter, and I'm going to teach you how to, you know, uh, forage for food, and I'm going to teach you how to... You're going to have to do those things with, while with poor health. With your health yelling at you, being super cold, being super hot, and being like, that's going to start affecting these people in the time of Jacob's trouble to try to get them to take the mark and worship the beast. All right. Revelation 11.6 says, they're, they're, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over water to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. These are the two witnesses. You say, well, who do you believe the two witnesses are? Matthew 17, 1 through 8. You can pause it and turn there now, or later on just remind yourself. Uh, Matthew 17, verse 1 through 8. Those are the two witnesses. That's who I believe the two witnesses are. Right. Minister, those two men are ministering to Jesus, and these two men will be preaching Jesus Christ to the Jewish people. Pre preaching Jesus Christ to the world. Okay. Revelation 16, 9, but I just want to show that there's, there's going to be plagues. Okay? Your health is going to be affected. And I can't remember, but Daniel, didn't Daniel get sick? There was a time that Daniel got sick. I could be wrong, uh, but you correct me, brother, says Christ. But Revelation chapter 16, verse 9 says, And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Job gave God glory in all that he lost, and all that he suffered. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you will have to endure great hardship without turning on God. How do you turn on God in that time period? You take the mark and you worship the beast. It's getting super hot. There's no AC out in the wilderness. <laughs> There's no AC when you're on the run. It's freezing cold. There's no electric heaters when you're on the run. You don't have, your clothes are falling apart because you can't buy clothes. You might try to start out with good clothes that are insulated that keep you warm, but clothes, when you're out in the, in the boonies all the time, they don't last that long. You won't have the warmest clothes in the world. It's going to be a hardship. It's going to be hard. Okay. That's what Job went through. That's what the, Jewish, the Gentiles are going to have to go through around the world. That mark of the beast system is going to come in, that one world religion... You got to be part of us, or you're on the run. You got to be part of us, or you lose everything. You got to be part of us, or you're going to lose your health. You got to be part of us, or you might get captured and end up losing your life. That's not for us today. Okay? I can I can end up losing my life for Jesus Christ as you had Christians do in the past, but it's not a requirement. If you get captured and you get told you have to take the mark of the beast or die, dying is now a requirement to stay saved. Because you're not present tense saved. You have to endure to the end or you have to die for Jesus Christ. A good example of this, while I'm thinking about it in my head, I was watching this, the, the movie John, I want to say Wick, Wickliffe. Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, and some of his followers that were giving out Bibles, just the New Testament at the time, uh, they had to recant or they were going to be killed. Some of them recanted. They didn't lose their salvation. You don't lose your salvation today. You might, like I said, they're still martyrs today, but the difference is, is there's people then, that's a great example, they recanted on, on, on you know, the real gospel, the, the Jesus Christ, and then later on down the road, they felt bad about what they did and said it was wrong what we did and they went back to the truth where they were first standing. So they fell away and they came back to the standing point. They didn't lose their salvation. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you recant, you take the mark and worship the beast, you lose your salvation. You don't get saved. 
you're guaranteed to go to hell. Okay. Now here's one. Just as Satan was tempting Job to turn on God, so is the man of sin in the one world system tempting those in the time of Jacob's trouble. They'll be tempting Daniel, those Jews that aren't sealed in the time. But they're also going to be tempting the world as a whole. So I kind of left this one for this one. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's us. We get taken out of the way. And then that man of sin is revealed. And that man of sin gets revealed, then we, get, we can get taken out of the way. I believe both, can, this is an old study that we did, because I disagree with some of the brethren. I believe that both events are connected. You can't have one without the other. And Jesus, because I've been correcting this before, Jesus breaking that seal, Satan get kicked out of heaven, those are two things that I believe that um, sets off this time period, that sets off those second two events where we get caught up and the man of sin gets revealed. Okay? He breaks the first seal. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. We get taken out of the way. We're hindering this time period, this seven-year time period. The body of Christ is keeping it from happening. As long as we're here, God's like, I'm not ready. We're still here. There's people to be to save. There's work to be done, brother, says Christ. Getting a little ahead of myself when we get into uh, Enoch. But we get taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. God allows Satan to do what he did to Job to test him. Satan's doing the same thing in the time of Jacob's trouble. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness and them that perish and them that perish. Them that gave in and took the mark and worshipped the beast. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Remember, you have to endure to the end and then you be saved. They didn't make it to the end. They gave in. Verse 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion. Those that took the mark and worshipped the beast. That they should believe a lie. What's that lie? Oh, you can take the mark and still be saved. Oh, we're sealed into the day of redemption. It's faith alone. Faith alone. In every dispensation, it's faith alone. There is no dispensation. Dispensational teaching, that's heresy. That they should believe a lie. You know when people are going to be taking the mark of the beast and worship the beast in that time period? It's going to be a lot of professing Christians around the world that refuse to get saved. They're not, they're false converts. Part of false religions. They refuse to repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save them. They refuse to throw the old man, that old wicked man, oh wretched man that I am, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Oh wretched man that I am, God be merciful to me a sinner. They won't throw that person on the, at the foot of the cross. They refuse to. They just have the head knowledge. And they go into that time period, they're going to take the mark and worship the beast, and they're going to believe a lie. What? You're still saved. It's no big deal. In fact, this really isn't the mark of the beast. And that huge statue that's talking and coming to life, uh, you can worship it. It's okay. We're not here to warn them. We're here to warn them not to go in there. I'm here to warn you to get truly saved and born again, if you're one of those people that fell for the easy believism. The false faith alone gospel, or you fell for some of these uh, people like Jehovah's Witness and Mormons and Catholicism, the Catholic Church, that teaches you you have to merit salvation, earn salvation, be worthy of, of God's grace, and you can't know that you're saved. All that lies. We're here to warn you now. When we leave, he who now left will let till you be taken out of the way. All you're going to have left is you've got to find a Bible. The body of Christ is gone. And a lot of people are going to buy it hook, line, sinker. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. How do you have pleasure in unrighteousness in that time period? You've got to take the mark and worship the beast. You know, who, whoever shall lose his life shall save it, but whoever shall find his life, you want everything back? Or you don't want to lose everything? 
they have pleasure in unrighteousness. And once again, to get everything back, wealth, family, health, you have lost. Just take the mark and worship the beast. Job, come on, just curse God and die. Come on, just curse God and die. We will not be in that time period. Like I said, I believe Job as a representation of the Gentiles in that time period. Okay. Just as God here, just as God started everything with Job, so God will start everything with the time of Jacob's trouble. Job 1 6. Job chapter 1, back to chapter 1 again, verse 6. Now these was the day, now, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came alongside them. And the Lord said, came uh, also among them, sorry, and Satan came also among them. Satan has to present himself before God too. Don't get me wrong, I said Satan is the one that's tempting them. God allowed Satan to tempt Job. But it's God that started this whole thing. Among them, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going, going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now a little side note, is that you, brother, says Christ? I keep praying, is that me? I fear God and I escheweth evil. I'm trying to do things God's way. I'm trying to hide God's word in my heart and live it. I'm trying to be pleasing in God's sight. But you see here, the Lord brought up Job. The Lord started what happened with Job. People will say, well, it was Satan. No, it was God. And then, of course, Job, uh, Satan says, well, if you do this and this, and, and God says, okay, go ahead, I'll allow you to do it to him. Okay. Satan had to get God's permission to do anything to Job. That time of Jacob's trouble, when Jesus Christ, who is God the Father, manifests in the flesh... God fully and completely, when he breaks that fuller seal, he's giving Satan permission to do what he's doing in the time of Jacob's trouble. He's unleashing the man of sin, the son of perdition, on this world. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you... you that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us. Some people say, well, that letter, people are just taking Paul's name. Aside. No, I prove that there's other letters where Paul says, we're going to get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. That that day is at hand. We need to live, live, we need to live every day as if we could go home today. I always say this, brothers and Christ, Tomorrow, if Jesus came back tomorrow, what do you need to get done for him today? If he came back today, are you ready? There's brethren that used to, in ministry that used to have that attitude, the right Bible attitude. Now they don't. They're so distracted by the world. They don't care whether Jesus is coming back tomorrow or today. They're not ready for it. And they're not getting things done today if Jesus was coming back tomorrow. They're, not getting, they're too busy distracted by the world. But it says, nor by letter from us is the day of Christ is at hand. Paul said before in other letters that the day, in 1 Thessalonians, that the day is at hand. He said in some of the other letters that, hey, that day, you know, could happen any time now. Verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. All right, and you keep reading that. Verse 7 says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. Taken out of the way. Who takes us out of the way? Jesus Christ. He opens that first seal. Uh, the, the clouds be rolled back like a scroll. I remember that in the hymn, and it's in the Old Testament. And he's going to call us home. Prophecies in the Old Testament. Um, he's going to call us home. He's going to break that first seal, he's going to call us home, and he's going to unleash the Antichrist. He's going to start the time of Jacob's trouble, just like he started everything that happened to Job. Um, real quick, Satan getting kicked out of heaven. You can read that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Through 17, if you want to pause it and read it, Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 17, you see Satan getting kicked out of heaven. 
and he takes a third of the angels with him. Some people say, well, that kind of happens a little bit in. Uh, so then there's, uh, if you just, you know, because like I said, it's not our dispensation. I just know we get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. The day of Christ, the day of redemption, that blessed hope. But you have Jesus opening the seal that starts the time, and Satan get kicked out of heaven. I always taught that that also starts the time period. You know, they go hand in hand, breaking the seal, Satan getting kicked out of heaven. But some people say, well, your timeline's a little bit off with Satan getting kicked out of heaven just yet. Because some people teach that we get caught up and we get to see Satan up there and the big battle happens and we get to see Satan get kicked out of heaven. I don't believe that. But we'll find out. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It doesn't change the fact that we're all going to get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble and we get to be with our Lord and Savior. Okay. Now, just as God started the time of Jacob's trouble, guess what? God ended the time of Jacob's trouble. Guess what? God's going to end the time... I'm sorry, just as God uh, started Job, He ended the, what Job was going through. Just as God started the time of Jacob's trouble, He's going to end the time of Jacob's trouble. God put an end to what Job was going through. Job chapter 38 through 42... A lot of chapters there. But you see, God comes down and starts talking to Job and starts setting everything straight. With his three friends and everything, he starts setting everything straight. Job 42.10, though, 42, 42 verse 10 says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. The Lord turned the captivity of Job. He ended what Job was going through. Mm -hmm. Jesus puts an end to the time of Jacob's trouble. Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 21, you read about him coming back on the white horse. Wipes out that 200 million man army with just his word. He marches into Jerusalem. He sets up his kingdom. He puts an end to the time of Jacob's trouble. Once again, Revelation 19, verse 11 through 21. That's Enoch. There's probably a lot more I could have said, but left it out. But Enoch, I believe, represents a Gentile around the world that goes through that time period. And we'll go back through all three again. You have Noah, the 144,000 Jews that are sealed in their forehead. And if you have a different theory, by all means, I'd love to hear it in the comment section. Like I said, this is not my dispensation. But I'm warning the brethren uh, that we need to stick for the gospel, and those that are part of false gospels... We're trying to reach them for Christ, and we're still trying to lead people to Christ that, that don't even know the, the, the gospel, the real gospel. In other words, people that just reject Jesus Christ, we're still trying to lead them to Christ. We have false converts that we're trying to lead to Christ, lost family members, friends, neighbors that we're still trying to lead to Christ. And I'm really kicking the faith alone crowd more than anything. Because there's a lot of people trying to pretend like they're one of us. I'm a King James Bible believer. I'm one of you. And they're promoting false gospels. You're going to have to go through this time period where, you're no, where, where you can't get sealed. Today we can get sealed. And we get to get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. But you keep rejecting Jesus Christ and the true plan of salvation. You're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble where only... Noah, <laughs> the 144,000 Jews, are sealed in their forehead and are protected by God. Daniel represents the Jewish people, I believe, that are having to deal directly with this man of sin, the son of perdition. The rest of the world gets to see him. Remember how the Bible talks about the whole world sees the two witnesses? They're beheaded and their bodies left in the street. And the whole world sees it. The whole world gets to see what's going on, but the Jews there primarily are going to be the ones that are having to deal with it. Just like Daniel had to deal with Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian system. He had to be there and had to deal with it. And then you have Job that represents the, the, the world, the, the rest of the world, uh, the Gentiles. Now you say, what about Enoch? You had him listed among the four names. <laughs> you know, cause that was those three people. Brothers and Christ, if you don't get saved today, you're going to have to go. Uh, Brothers and I, I said it wrong, forgive me professing brethren, professing Christians that reject the true plan of salvation, reject the King James Bible as God's perfect written word, where you find the true plan of salvation, you're going to have to go into that time period. If you're a Jew, I doubt Jews are watching this, but if you're a Jew watching this, you're going to go in, you're going to be Daniel. 
more than likely. If you're blessed, you'll be like Noah, but you're going to be a Daniel more than likely. If you're a Gentile that rejects the true plan of salvation and go into that time period, you're going to be a Job. You're going to have to also do your best not to take the mark or worship the beast. And the whole world is going to be against you. Your family is going to be against you. Your own flesh, your own health is going to be against you. And you're going to end up losing everything. Everything. Now, brothers of Christ, to us that are saved, we are getting distracted sometimes by this. We're not supposed to be worried about Noah. We're not supposed to be worried about Daniel when applied to this study. We're not supposed to be worried about um, Job as it applies to this study, the time of Jacob's trouble. In other words, we're not supposed to be worried about the time of Jacob's trouble. Today, brothers of Christ, you have a lot of men, good men in ministry, and a lot of brothers and sisters of Christ, you're getting distracted by the world and what's going on. What are we supposed to be focused on? Enoch. We're not supposed to be focused on Noah when it comes to the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not supposed to be worried about the time of Jacob's trouble and how it's going to come in and, and every... No. We're supposed to be Enoch. Enoch equals the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, in Christ, Christians, Christ in, in Christ, Christians, at the day of Christ, the day of redemption, that blessed hope. Enoch was caught up. Before the flood even started, we got caught up. Like I said, Noah doesn't represent the body of Christ. He still went through the flood. He was protected in the ark by God, but he still went through the flood. Enoch never had to go through the flood. Enoch represents us. Now Enoch, in Genesis 5, turn to Genesis chapter 5, verse 18. And Jared lived a hundred sixty and two years, and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch eight hundred years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were nine hundred sixty and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived sixty and five years, and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God. I have to have to point that out, because remember Noah. Noah walked with God, and God protected him in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, Daniel it said he was beloved of God, and I'm not saying Daniel was against God, but it didn't say Daniel walked with God. It didn't say Job walked with God. Is there something to that? I believe there is, because both these times, Noah, he's protected by God, and Enoch, we don't have to go through it. He walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And you read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. There's that word again, where I try to talk to you, brothers Jesus Christ, a little side note. Are you, are you really working hard to please God? Are you getting into the, falling into the trap of pleasing your own flesh? Pleasing the world? You know, pleasing the people in the world. And the reason that's bad is because they're always going to try to pull you away from the Lord. You can't please God and your flesh at the same time. You can't please God and please this world. In that time of Jacob's trouble, in order to please your flesh... If you're getting flesh, like I said, when you start pleasing your flesh, your flesh is going to want stuff that's contrary to this. You start getting into the world and pleasing the world, and the people of the world, the ways of the world, compromising, they're going to start pulling you away from this. When you get caught up, what happens after the blessed hope? The judgment seat of Christ. He had the time, uh, he had this, um, he, he had this testimony that he pleased God. The body of Christ, those who truly get saved and born again, right then and there, you pleased God. We are now Enoch. We're going to get caught up someday in life. Now, you say, what about the old the saints from 2,000 years ago? Uh, saints, but the uh, body of Christ, bride of Christ, in Christ, Christians, okay? Sometimes called saints. But those who have died already from Paul's day... 
from Paul's day all the way to the catching away of the body of Christ. You have some people that die. Well, we're going to get to that verse where the dead in Christ rise first, and the, we which remain shall be caught up. Okay, he didn't see death, and when we actually have the catching away, those who haven't died yet, they won't see death. There was a great study done by 33rd Book where he talks about how Enoch represents everyone that, that never died. Moses will represent people that had to die twice, and Elijah represents, represents people that have died once. And people will say, well, Elijah never died. He will when he comes back as one of the two witnesses. You say, Moses only died once. He'll die a second time when he comes back as one of the two witnesses. All right. But 1 Corinthians 15, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Sorry for the long study. Probably going to have to break it down into two parts. 1 Corinthians 15... After the gospel is being preached, first fifteen fifty. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now some people believe you can leave you're, we're gonna leave our clothes behind. I don't. I believe this clothes that I'm wearing is going to be turned into a white robe that's given to me by God and it's washed clean. Okay? I'm going to be given a new body. Some people believe blood gets left behind. I don't. We'll find out when it happens. It's not worth breaking fellowship over, brother says Christ. I don't. It, doesn't, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. It doesn't say anything about anything being left behind. That blood... They, they can't inherit the kingdom of God, and that flesh, it gets changed. And here we read it, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This, okay. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. That's what I believe happens in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. See this false teaching that... We just vanish and go straight up like instant warp and clothes get left behind or blood gets left behind. That's not what happens. We get changed. The moment the twinkling of an eye is when we get our new bodies. I'm going to hear God call my name. And when God calls my name, I'm going to get a new body. I'm going to get new clothes. And then I'm going to look up and God's going to say, come up hither. And then a cloud's going to form under my feet. I believe this because Jesus went up this way. And I'm going to go up. And everyone's going to see. It's going to be an event that the whole world sees. And the dead in Christ rise first. We're going to get to that verse. They get their incorruptible bodies. And then they go up. Then we get our incorruptible bodies. Then we go up. But this moment in a, tremp in a twinkling of an eye is when we get our incorruptible bodies. Dead in Christ rise first. And it's like instant you just like you blink your eyes, and there's someone standing there. There was no one there before, now there's someone standing there. Incorruptible body, the dead in Christ. And then you blink your eyes again, and then you look at yourself, and all of a sudden, instantly, we have a new body. Those that are still alive and haven't died yet, we have a new body. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus calls us home, starts the time of Jacob's trouble. He calls us home. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what we're looking for, brothers and Christ. We're not looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. Don't get distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble, what the mark of the beast is, who the false prophet's going to be, who the, you know, I've talked about a little bit, sometimes I get kind of caught up in that. Try not to get caught up into it too much. Who the man of sin is going to be, how the one world order is going to come in, how the one world monitor. Don't get caught up in that stuff. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. We're looking for this. When we get changed, then corruption must put on incorruption. This moral must put on immortality. That's what we're living for. That's where our focus is supposed to be. Not on Noah, 
in this context, I'm not talking about we can't we can study Noah, but I'm talking about for this context where Noah is a type of person in the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not supposed to be looking for the time of Jacob's. We're not Noah. We're not Daniel. We're not Job. What are we? We're Enoch. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unremovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We shall reap if we faint not. Was it make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof? For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What's the whole point of keeping that blessed hope on your in your in your head and on your heart and always working keeping that judgment seat of Christ on your head and your heart to keep us faithful for the Lord and living for Him? What is the flesh, the world, and the enemies always trying to do? Take us our eyes off that blessed hope. And lately, it just seems like with the body of Christ, Satan's trying to take your eyes off that blessed hope and put it on the time of Jacob's trouble. He's taking your eyes off that blessed hope and putting it on the world. Don't take your eyes off that blessed hope with the life that you're living. Always be mindful. Jesus comes back tomorrow. What do I need to get done from today? Jesus comes back today. Am I ready? 1 Thessalonians, if you're not, get your heart right with God. Get back to being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 13 through 18. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Sleep. The brethren that have already died. Okay. The brethren for the past 2,000 years. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of our Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know why the brethren aren't comforted that much in these days? Because your eyes aren't on that blessed hope. You're not looking for the day of Christ. You're not looking for the day of redemption. Some of you aren't even ready for it. It's not too late. Get ready for it. Get your heart right with God today. But what's causing people not to have comfort? Satan's getting you to indulge in the flesh. I know some brethren that have gotten back into the flesh and worldliness. Getting you distracted by what's going on in the world. Getting you to look for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not supposed to be looking for it. We're not supposed to be living for it. You have some brethren, they're trying to act like, they're trying to be so subtle and act like, well, I'm not trying to prepare for the time of Jacob's trouble. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. This whole teaching that we could go through some hard times before we get caught up. The body of Christ has always gone through hard times. For the last 2,000 years. The mission doesn't change. But you have brethren that have turned their back on looking for that blessed hope, and they're too busy looking at the world and seeing the time, of, like it's preparing for the time of Jacob's trouble, and now they're starting to prep, and they're starting to work towards the time of Jacob's trouble. They're not working for that blessed hope anymore. They're working towards the time of Jacob's trouble, preparing for the time of Jacob's trouble. And when you call them out on it, oh no, I'm not preparing for the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm just saying we could go through some hard times before we get caught up. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another. Right. Now, some of you might ask me, where do you get the day of Christ, the day of redemption? Those are the two titles I mainly use for those times. I'm trying to use. It's, it's hard because we were, we were told uh, it's rapture, not caught up, and that it's pre-time of Jacob's trouble. You know, the pre-trib rapture. But that's not what the Bible calls it. What does God Bible call that event where we get caught up? Okay. Romans chapter 2, verse 16, we read, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, there will be a day when God will show us, judge, 
who truly, who's truly saved and who is lost. Now don't be wrong, but Paul says, examine whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves, prove your own selves, and, or prove all things. And there's people that he doubted their salvation. I'm in doubt of some of you. I'm reading that in, um, where am I at? Galatians, where someone comes in and talks them into a false gospel. Kind of like today, all, this, all these false gospels out there. They're all based on making it out that salvation is based off of what you're doing, whether it's keeping the Levitical laws, or whether it's turning faith into works, making it out something that you're doing that saved you, so you can justify sin. But Paul sits in here and says that, uh, I was reading one of these where he says, I, I, I stand in doubt of you. Was he doubting their salvation? Yes, we're supposed to prove our salvation today. We're supposed to live a life of Christ. We're supposed to prove ourselves and be approved. Okay, proving and up, being approved. But in that day, when we get caught up, the day of Christ, the day of redemption, that's going to be the ultimate test. 1 Corinthians 1.8, we read, and I'll go through these fast. 1 Corinthians 1.8, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. There you have the day of Christ, but the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform, will perform it until the day of Christ. Philippians 1.10, That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Philippians 2.16, Holding forth the words of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And this is where some of the brethren are button heads. Okay? Some with me. And I've lost a brother in Christ because of this right here. 2 Thessalonians 2 in fellowship. 2 Thessalonians 2 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, be troubled neither by spirit nor by words nor by letter from us as the day of Christ is at hand. Not day of the Lord, day of Christ. That catching away. We're supposed to live every day as if it's at hand. And like I said, in 1 Thessalonians, he talks about that day being at hand. Okay. It's not called the day of Christ in 1 Thessalonians, but that day being at hand. He talks about this day being at hand. Okay. Till the day of Christ. The day of Christ. Till the day of Christ. The day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. That's all the times it talks about the day of Christ. It's a title for that catching away, where we get caught up for that event. And I believe the whole world will see it. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So that's where we get the day of Christ, day of redemption. Where do you get that blessed hope? Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. It is Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying, this is how you look for the blessed hope. And we read it over there too, that you know that your work is not in vain, continuing the work of the Lord. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, the time of the Gentiles. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope. Jesus calls us home. Jesus starts the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And here's the big one, 15. Think uh, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. I'm rebuking some of the brethren in this video. If you're looking at the time of J Jacob's trouble and you're starting to get caught up in the world and everything, this is a soft rebuke. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Some brethren, their ministries have just become talk shows. Worldly talk shows. This is what's going on in the world. That's what's going on in the world. There's no such thing as a Christian news ministry. This is what we're supposed to be preaching and teaching. We're supposed to be exhorting the brethren to live for that blessed hope and looking for the, uh, and preparing for the judgment seat of Christ. Put on the whole armor of God. 
Okay? Being a living witness and a verbal witness to hide God's Word in your heart, to stay in God's Word, to stay in prayer, to love your brothers and sisters in Christ, to love the lost world by being a living witness and a verbal witness. Okay? Putting on the armor of light, putting on Jesus Christ, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be exhorting brethren to live for that blessed hope. Watch out for ministries that have turned from actually preaching the Word of God and exhorting the brethren. Watch out for them. Okay. There's some brethren that used to te preach the Word of God hardcore, and now they don't. There's some that have just disappeared. Used to do good Bible studies, and then they just disappeared. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We're not supposed to be looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. Enoch foretold of our coming back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Jude 1, 14 says, Jude chapter 1, verse 14 reads, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. We get to come back with the Lord at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. We don't go through the time of Jacob's trouble. We get to come back with him. We're looking for that blessed hope. But another thing about Enoch that, we're, that applies to us, uh, 2 Timothy 2.12 says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. We won't get to come back with him. We'll be up in heaven. You know, when you're sealed, you're sealed. Sealed until the day of redemption. Okay? When you're saved, you get to go with us when we get caught up. But some, I believe a lot of brethren, aren't going to get to come back down. Because you're not suffering for him. You're not putting the flesh down like you're supposed to. Like we just read there. Teaching us that denying ungodliness, some of you guys aren't doing that. Or worldly lust, some of you aren't doing that. We should live soberly, some of you aren't doing that. Righteously, some of you guys are getting back into the lust of the flesh. You're getting into worldliness, covetousness, idolatry. Anything that's down here that comes before the Lord becomes an idol. And godly, some of you aren't doing that in this present world. Get your heart right with the Lord. It's not too late, brothers, says Christ. Get your heart right with the Lord. Okay? But if we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. Putting down the flesh, being separate from the world, not conforming to the world, love not the world, not being a friend to the world, you're going to start suffering a lot of loss. But remember what Paul said again. The sufferings of this present time are not to be compared to the glory that awaits us. If you suffer with Him, you shall also reign with Him. If you deny him, he also deny us. What is he denying you? You won't be one of those ten thousands of his saints that get to come back with Jesus Christ to rule and reign for a thousand years with Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, 14 says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's where I kind of get we get a new robe. I know the Bible, like people, some brethren are probably saying, well, Where did you get that? We get, uh, we're clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We get a, a whole new wardrobe. Clothes that never wear out. Okay. Make sure you are looking for that blessed hope, preparing for the judgment seat of Christ, brothers of Christ. Yes, we talked about it. For those who refuse to get saved, what you're going to have to go through if you don't get saved today. Because I see the signs too, brothers of Christ. I see what's going on in the world. I see the world going the way and, and God setting everything up. It's, people think it's Satan. No, it's God preparing to pour his wrath out on this world. What's preventing him? This man right here. If you're truly saved and born again, you're watching it, you're preventing it from happening. God said it's not time yet, but it could happen any day. And you're going to end up having to go through that time period and be one of those three people going through that time period and what you're going to have to go through. And you have to endure to the end. And the part I left out was, you have to. people think you endure to the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. You're good to go. No. Now you've got to make it through the day of the Lord. Well, I made it through the day of the Lord. I'm good to go. No. Now you've got to make it through that time period after the day of the Lord where Satan's let loose for a season. And you still have to be faithful. What time is, the best time to get saved is today. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Get truly saved today. And brothers and sisters Christ that are saved, get your heart right with the Lord today. Get your eyes back on that blessed hope. 
Enoch's what matters, not the other three men. To us, it's Enoch. To us, we're living a life of Christ looking for that blessed hope. Okay. Let's see if I can find it. We're going to end it with a hymn. <laughs> we're going to stop right there. We're going to end with a hymn. Sorry for this being so long, but brothers is Christ, sometimes to get a good study, okay. Trying to look for, I want to sing that song, What a Day That'll Be. And here it is. Because that just, Brothers of Christ, that's what we're looking for. That's what we're living for. These people that refuse the true plan of salvation, reject repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And have, when God saves you, that new life, that you're, you're all about serving God and doing what's right. We still backpedal. We still fail. I'm not saying we're perfect. But our heartfelt desire is for the Lord and someone who's truly saved. I've said this time and time again. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. You still see someone who's saved still moving forward. They might be just inching and not amounting, you know, having a hard time and just barely inching because they keep backpedaling. But someone who says, I'm saved, and they're running 100 miles in the opposite direction? No, you're not. And you talk to these people and you realize they reject repentance as it applies to salvation. That's why there's no changed life. That's why there's no new creature in Christ Jesus. That's why there's no new birth. They're going to have to go into that time period. But us, brothers and sisters of Christ, we're looking for this day. What a day that will be. Let's see if I can... I've been talking a lot. Forgive me. My throat's getting dry. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be there'll be no sorrow there no more burdens to bear no more sickness no pain no more parting over there and forever i will be with the one who died for me what a day glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my jesus i shall see and i look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be brother says christ i've said it a million times i guess i'll keep saying it brother says christ please keep your eyes on that day don't take your eyes off jesus christ don't take your eyes off that blessed hope. Keep living a life of Christ. Get your heart right with the Lord today. Get your heart right with the brethren if you've wronged brethren. Make amends. Get your heart right with the Lord. And always be living every day for Jesus Christ. Living every day for that blessed hope. Always preparing for the judgment seat of Christ. Where we're going to be judged someday according to our works, our life down here. Not our salvation, not our eternal salvation. We get everlasting life. That's a gift. It's a free gift. But how we get to spend eternity, our rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, is going to be determined how we live a life of Christ today. Keep your eyes on that blessed hope. And I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for listening. And stay in the Word of God. Stay in prayer. And I'll see you in the next study.